they started meeting. They started coming up with these ideas, these solutions, and everything. And now, where we are now is we are presenting some of these ideas to the public, and we want the public to present their ideas back to the committees. Once, those, once all of this information is compiled, we're going to go back with the committee again and create a document, create a strategic plan for at least hopefully five years to where we can reduce crime in our area. The problem is, in, in our community, I think Jody asked me earlier uh, you know, about this plan. The problem is we don't have a plan. We have no guidebook. We have no direction. So, so that leaves us at the whim of everything that happens around us. We need a plan, and that's what this is all about. So, uh, and I don't, I don't remember what the timeline is. Virginia, what's the timeline on us coming back with the document? Uh, April twelfth. So we, we're supposed to be coming, and we, right now, believe it or not, we are on time with our timeline. So everything is moving according to plan. So by April twelfth. We, we hope and we expect to have that document regurgitated to bring back for adoption by the community. So that's where we are. And at this time, am I leaving anything out with you? Okay. Y'all see who the boss is, right? <laughs> okay. So at this time, oh, yellow card. So if you please make sure you fill these out. Because uh, even though we've created the task force, the task force is, is expandable. So we want everyone, everyone that's, uh, that wants to be involved in this to be involved in this. So please fill this card out. And, uh, and if you have any questions, uh, you, you will get a chance to ask your questions. How you doing? You will get a chance to ask your questions. But put your questions on here too, because just in case we don't have an answer for your question now, we're going to come go back and find an answer to your question and, and get back with you. So make sure that all of your information is on here. And please also, Include your email address, more importantly, please include your email address on there. I don't see a slot for your email address, but put your email address on there if you have an email address. And also your uh, mobile phone number, because we will contact you. And we want you to be involved, so please get involved. Uh, County Commissioner uh, Willie Brooks, y'all can give him a round of applause. <laughs> he is the County Commissioner for this area, and we're, we're, we're proud of him, we're excited to have him. Uh, so at this time, at this time, we are going to introduce our panelists. And we're going to start from my left to right. Jump on. Hi, my name is Glenn Mullins. I uh, send greetings from our chairman, Justin Chisley, who couldn't be here tonight. Um, I am the uh, part of the business committee. And through informal interviews with business owners, we uh, were tasked with assessing their needs. Hi, my name is Stephanie Love. I am a school board member for District 3, which includes uh, most of Raleigh. Good evening. I'm Colonel Frank Garrett. I'm the commander of the Old Allen Precinct, which is just down the street at, on Old Allen Road. Good evening. I'm Willie Brooks. I'm the county commissioner for District 6, which represents Raleigh, North Frazier, part of North Bush. Good evening, Brian Scott, Executive Director of Youth Dimensions. Oh, okay. Uh, Executive Director of Youth Dimensions. Uh, we're located in the Raleigh area. We primarily serve a lot of youth that are in the North Memphis, Raleigh, Virginia area. Good evening, Pastor Lavon Brooks. I'm Pastor Charis, which is Baptist Church. We have represented business, Pastor Scorsoli, in the North Memphis. Good evening, I'm Theodora Alecos and I am chairman and representing the Community uh, and Neighborhood Association. Okay, and before we get to, to their uh, uh, suggestions and solutions, I want, to, I want to introduce, okay, I want to introduce Mr. Pickley. Yes. <coughs> Can you tell us what you're doing also? Uh, I'm with uh, Rotary International. I'm a district governor. I'm one of 537 from around the world, and we are going to have a peace farm on Saturday at uh, Whispering Woods and we're going to tackle a new program. We have the peace farm as a kickoff for a five year program by District 6800 and that's North Mississippi, all of Shelby County including Memphis. We are going to have a, uh, a five year program to reduce juvenile crime 
in this area in the Mid-South by 50% in five years. This was a commitment by the district board, which is, includes all Rotary members from the whole area, 18 members. We introduced it last December. They approved it, and this Saturday, this peace form that we'll have will address the problem. First of all, we're going to say, what's the problem? And we have three individuals, and these are incredible people. Can, tell me if I'm going too long, because I can go on forever. <laughs> okay. And the Peace Forum will be moderated by Judge Joe Gibbs from Clarksdale, Mississippi, and he is a past district governor. He's an incredible man, an attorney. And then our panelists are Bill Courtney, who was the guy that I met in Tupelo last year, and we got together, and I said, we got to talk. And then we have Luther Mercer. I don't know if you, any of you know Luther Mercer. He's an incredible guy. He's a world negotiator. He teaches at um, uh, St. George School. And then we have Celeste Wilson, who is a youth county judge. And they are going to go through, figure out the crime problem we have, how we are going to address it. And there's three experts in it. And you all know Bill Courtney and what he's done. Coach Bill Clinton, he's, he's known as Coach. But anyway, Saturday, we, ex we are inviting everybody in this room to come to Whispering Woods, 9 a.m. to 12 a.m. We're gonna have a question and answer session, but we're gonna come up with some se seven recommendations, and then we're gonna form a separate board within our district to work with your task force, work with your task force. So we're gonna work together. We're gonna be together for five years now. And we're going to solve it because it's an unbelievable truth. I learned last week, and I'll end right here. Uh, uh, I talked to the Crime Commission in Shelby County last week. Of all the crime in 2014, 74% of it was youth crime, juvenile crime. That's a number that just, I want to cry. Because that, that's not good, because we can't grow, we can't do, we have to hit education, we have to hit everything to make this city grow. We're not growing. Nashville is. Why? Youth crime. Thank you. Thank you. So Saturday, Saturday, 9 a.m. At the Whispering Woods. Whispering Woods. Everybody's invited. We want you there. Where is it located? Olive Branch. Excuse me, Olive Branch. What's your question, name? Where is it located? Whispering Woods. Uh, Whispering Woods and Olive Branch. And Olive Branch, okay. Might be, it might Ax, serve Ax better to bring three up the business, though. What help? What help? But it was... Well, it does include... Right, right, right. Well, we appreciate you. <laughs> and, uh, and just, I just want to touch on, on uh, hopefully, you know, juvenile jobs will come out of that meeting also. Yeah, you know, and, and, and some things for, uh, for the, you know, keep, these, keep the kids busy also. Uh, one of the things I want to touch on before before they start talking about their um, their ideas um, is, is something to think about. I just want you guys, to, want, want, want everyone in the audience to think about this. Just think about it. You know, a lot of our resources are tied up. I tried to pass a, I tried to pass a law last year, and I brought it back this year again. Um, that would that would basically marry uh, individuals that illegally supply guns to minors. No, key word is illegally supply guns to mine, because I have no issue with guns myself. Legal guns. Now, illegally supply guns to mine. It would cost the state $70,000 to enact that, enact that law. $70,000. We couldn't get it passed because it cost the state $70,000. Now think about that, man. We're cutting the supply of guns off at, at the ankles. And how I would do that is it, simply, it, if, if, if someone illegally supplied a gun to a minor, then they would be on the hook for the crime that that minor committed also. That's how that law would work. And, and, and because it cost, it, it cost the state $70,000, $70,000 to the state of Tennessee. Y'all know what the budget is for the state of Tennessee? It's, it's all up there, right. But the point is, they didn't want to spend $70,000 to, to enact this law. And, and their, their reason was because, you know, we're, we're, our resources are limited. Well, then we need to take, we need to take a look at really what, what, what crimes we want to incarcerate for. 
You know, if we if we have limited resources and you're incarcerating people for, for minor petty crimes, then we need to revisit who we're incarcerating and what we're incarcerating for. And I always tell tell everyone there are two types of crimes, only two. There are crimes that make us mad, and there are crimes that make us scared. And you have to ask yourself, which ones do you want to incarcerate? Now, I can stand a little irritation, but I don't like the, the ax murderer you know, coming down the street and I can't, I, we can't put him away. But that's what we're dealing with. That's what we're dealing with at State Tennessee. So it's, it's important that, that, that each and every one of you, you really put some pressure on your legislators. Put pressure on your legislators to stop with the, with the madness that's going on at our, at our state level, because that's where the laws are made. And, and make them accountable for, for the laws that need to be uh, enforced and, 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 and really added to versus those that are just locking people up, just to lock people up and, 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 and put the strain on our state. Okay? At this point, we're, we're going to go with our uh, panelists and we can talk about those solutions and, and, and ideas. And then once they're finished going through their list, then we'll open it up because we want to hear from the, from the uh, uh, audience also your ideas and solutions, and we're going to capture all of this information and then and create a document from this information, okay? So, uh, anywhere in particular, anybody, anybody want to start? <laughs> Everybody's pointing at you. <laughs> kind of like, uh, who wants to volunteer? Not anybody. All right, all right. Okay, so I'll turn it over to the panelists. Thank you. Again, my name is Glenn Mullins, uh, and I was part of the Committee for Business, and through informal interviews with local business leaders, we tried to, we were tasked with finding their needs and uh, understanding their needs, and basically it came down to loss prevention versus new customers. Uh, they felt like they were willing to let the customers that they have currently keep them in business. Um, so. And you can see uh, in the agenda, uh, they were willing to have uniformed officers and, and closed circuit TVs and um, police uh, camera towers in their parking lots because they felt like loss prevention was the most important thing for them. Um, we will have a formal meeting with them to be held at Methodist uh, North Hospital on April 2nd at 5 p.m. if you are a business leader and you would like to be uh, part of that. Uh, if you're just a regular civilian and you'd like to be part of that, please come see me afterwards and we'll get you on the list. I don't, I don't know if he touched on this also. Uh, one of the things that came out of the uh, business meeting, uh, well, the business committee also was the creation of a business line. Did you say that? No. Okay, the creation of a business alliance for this area. Right now, there is no business alliance for this area. And why, why does that matter? Why does that matter? It, it, it matters because one, one thing you're doing when you create this business alliance is you, you create a single voice for all of the businesses in the area. That's one thing. And then one thing uh, that will put uh, pressure on, on, on politicians is when the business community starts speaking. And so there's a, there's a need for it. This, this is how it works. I'm sorry, y'all. Don't, 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 don't blame me. Don't run me out of here. Uh, but, but a lot of times when the business community speaks, you know, the elected officials start listening. I listen now, y'all. You know, I listen now. But, but we need a business alliance. Plus, you know, and, and think about it in regards to crime uh, at businesses. And maybe one of our, maybe Colonel Gary can touch on that too. You know, some of the crime thefts and things that go on in the businesses in this area. Can you touch on that? Yes, sir. Um, what we've seen lately, uh, we have a lot of, across the business, we have a lot of misdemeanor thefts. Uh, basically shoplifting. That we noticed there's a lot of increase in that. Uh, we've taken some steps uh, to try to make it harder for the perpetrators uh, as far as law enforcement is concerned. Uh, currently, basically, if you get a small thing, it's a misdemeanor, you can't have a $500 per store. You come there, if you're, if you're arrested on the store, if the owner catches you, they'll come in. And usually with this issue of misdemeanor citation, a uh, piece of paper, as long as you get the proper identification, you go on your way, you report to it. Four one pop a few fingerprinted and photographs, then you go to court later on. What we've instructed our officers are to, when we make these calls, do a records check on the suspect, on the defendant in this case, and see if they have prior theft charges against them. If they've had prior thefts, we're now going to transport them because we do have the option to transport them. Uh, therefore, they will have to post a bond to get out, and which makes it a little bit more difficult for them to, to instead of just getting a piece of paper and walking away. 
Uh, that is one of the things that we can institute it about, I guess, I said about three weeks ago with my office in my particular precinct with the blessings of my chief. Uh, we do have uh, portable cameras in some areas. You may have seen some over at the Marshalls uh, doing Christmas. I think we had one up at uh, Walmart, if I'm not mistaken. We have one up at Kmart. Uh, we have several in some of the apartment complexes. Well, those are things that, that we have to move around because we are limited on the, on the resources that we have. Sometimes we'll leave them for an extended period of time and then we'll move them someplace else to another store location. But those are the things that as, as, as law enforcement, we're trying to make a change, try to do something different as well. We've also been toying with that idea of doing a business watch. We have what's known as the apartment managers meeting once a month in my precinct. Uh, we've been talking about it. We currently, we're, we're, we're doing, we're trying to get a, a clergy watch started, but the business watch is going to be the next one after the clergy watch. And therefore, which works out because now we can get with the business. Uh, committee and maybe get that started a little bit sooner. Basically what we would do then is just have a meeting again. We have a meeting at the precinct once a month, once a quarter, excuse me, more than likely, more, just once a quarter, to find out what concerns the business owners are having, uh, what we can do to assist, and hopefully we'll bring people in to talk to them, to tell them what they can do inside of their stores, uh, of course the security, as far as, as, far as their uh, personnel that they use to, to, buy, to, to buy their security. And hopefully we can come up with solutions again to hopefully cut down a lot of these deaths. But so we will be looking at you afterwards uh, so we can get that started. We'll have a representative that you're in. Again, <clears throat> my name is Willie Brooks with the, uh, and I represent the elected officials. Um, commit, uh, Commissioner Norma Lester was a part of my committee uh, as we came up with recommendations from the elected official. Things that we came up with in terms of, rec uh, of recommendations, one is to know your representatives. In this district, you have uh, Representative uh, Parkinson, you have Rep uh, City Council Bill Morrison, myself as County Commissioner, uh, and then Commissioner Love who represented education. And we had collectively uh, came to agreement that we would work together for the betterment of this district. But what we would like to do is get input from you as to what things that you would like to see done. It's very important that, uh, that you engage us in your department by inviting us to the various uh, committee meetings that you might have, uh, attend our council meetings and, and county commission meetings. Uh, the county commission meets uh, every other Monday at 3 o'clock. We have a committee meeting every other Wednesday. And in those committee meetings is when we talk about issues that's facing uh, Shelby County government as well as what's going on in our committee. Within the Shelby County Commission, we do have a law enforcement committee that talks about issues in relationship to law enforcement. But more importantly, I think it's incumbent on us as constituents in the district or as neighbors that we form neighborhood associations that would address many of the issues that we have in the community. When we look at the budget of both the city and the county, yesterday I was meeting with the CEO with the Shelby County as we prepare for the budget for for an income year, a large percentage of the funds of your tax dollars go toward law enforcement. But it still is not addressing the issues. I think we, as a community, has to address these issues because we live in our neighborhoods, we know what's going on in our neighborhoods, and we can watch what's going on by being engaged with our neighbors. As I, when I grew up, I knew the neighbors on my street. I was able to go and talk to them and all of that. But what happened now is we're on our streets, but we don't know our neighbors. Am I right? Right. So what we want to do is be able to engage our street you know, from the block clubs where we can watch these other houses and kind of engage in those activities. And when you do that, invite the elected officials to be a part of that. So we all can get to know each other. And we know our neighbors and we know when someone comes in the neighborhood that doesn't fit. Who belongs on the street? I like to encourage us to do that, but more importantly, let us know what we can do from an elected official standpoint. And I think that's pretty, pretty much what some of the suggestions that we have. Now, what we want to do is make sure that uh, we provide some funding support for the neighborhood associations that will allow you to do more activities and reach out to those neighbors in your communities. So, so those are some of the things that we came up with for a discussion in terms of the elected officials. I guess it's my turn to Commissioner Brooks uh, skip me. <laughs> um, 
when, when we talk about education, mine may be a little lengthy because um, everything that goes on in the city of Memphis uh, involves education, everything. And some of the things that I put down were uh, are the organizations, nonprofits, for profit, school of doctors and community leaders. Um, are we truly involved in the school? You know, every school has one or two of doctors, but are they truly involved in the school to help um, decrease the crime? Uh, what I've noticed is we have a large number of kindergartners that are being suspended or expelled from school. Um, that's, that's the issue. So what, what are we doing to, to address that? Uh, will the agencies, meaning Shelby County, the City of Memphis, Juvenile Court, La Bonner, anybody that deals with our youth, will they actually come together? What I notice is the City of Memphis, everybody has something going on, but nobody is connected to find out the problem. If you have a principal, we have Mr. Griffin. He's the new principal of Raleigh Egypt High School. He has over 600 children in his care Monday through Friday. But forums about youth violence are set up all over Memphis and nobody comes back to principals. Nobody asks the teachers to come to this, these events. Nobody um, asks the school board to come to these events. We want to be involved, we want to help combat crime, but everybody wants to do things separately, but they want things to change. Um, are we willing to actually visit the schools? Are we willing to actually get on the ground and go and talk to the youth? They're not gonna come here, so we're gonna have to get out and go and talk to them. Are we willing to go to community centers? Are we willing to go to the, the streets? Are we willing to go to the parking lots? Are we willing to go in the stores? Are we willing to go to the movies, the restaurants where all of these kids are hanging out at and actually talk to them? Because by us meeting here behind closed doors, it's not helping our youth. We have to get out and do something different. We have to go to where they are. Um, we have a lot of low parental involvement in our schools. Um, some teachers don't have numbers on our parents. But guess what? We all have neighbors. Do we actually know our neighbors? We see children walking every single day that are not in school. Are you actually picking the phone up to call a police officer and say, hey, these three children are walking down the street. It's 12 o'clock um, you know, in the evening. Uh, they're supposed to be in school. The issue is none of us want to get involved unless it's with our children. Um, our children don't value life. Our children don't respect the police officers. They do not respect authority, period. That's our fault. It's not just because your child respects authority. It does not mean that it's, that's not a problem. All of our children need to know that, I mean, it's, 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 it's a way of life that, that needs to be followed. Um, they don't care about the police. They don't care about parents. Um, they don't care if they die, and that's a problem. Um, Recruitment of gang members. This is recruitment season. What are we doing about it? We know it's a problem. We know every year around this time, gang members are recruiting our children. What are we doing now to do something about it to save, save a child's life? Um, our schools are not fully staffed. You know, our, there's resources that, that we need, but we don't have them in the school. That's our problem, the board's problem because I believe every school needs to start on the first day of school with everything that it needs. Um, a lot of our schools don't have that. Our children end up dropping out of school because they're 17 years old in the ninth grade, can't read, um, because nobody took the time out to say this fourth grader couldn't read, but what they instead, they passed them on. Fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth grade, now you have a 17 year old who can't read. Um, sexual harassment, we have a lot of children that are sexually harassing other children. And it may not be the sexual harassment you guys think of. If you touch a person inappropriately, that is sexual harassment. They may get suspended or expelled from school from that. So, I mean, what are the nonprofits who are getting these thousands and thousands of dollars, what are they doing to actually help us uh, combat that problem? Our teachers are not being told that, but uh, well, they're not being taught to teach conflict resolution. We know the issues in the school. Why do we have to wait for two kids to get to fighting or for somebody to bring a gun or a knife to school and that child ends up getting expelled 
or sent to jail when we know there's issues in the school. You know, we need people who will actually come into the school and talk to these children before something deadly happens. Um, you know, and those, those those are the yeah those are the uh, most of the things that I have. But I mean, really, what I'm trying to get out of this, I really want us all to be on the same page. Um, I'm sick of meeting to just meet. Um, I, I want solutions, and you know, I believe Representative Parkinson. Uh, you know, I, I believe he has a strong group of people. But I mean, I'm sick of looking at the news. I'm sick of our children dying. Sick of us sitting up here saying that it's not our problem just because we know our children are in the house. You know, I'm, I'm sick of all of this. Uh, I have children. A lot of people have children, and I mean, we, like Representative Parkinson said, we have to do something different today because the old way, the way we used to handle business, it's not working. Seventy-four percent of our kids are committing crimes. The seventy-four percent of the crimes that happen in Memphis are from our children, we got a problem. Well, I mean, we, we got a problem, and it's enough for each and every one of us in here to take a child by the hand and lead them the right way. You know, I mean, it's, 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 it's serious, so we, we, we have to do something different. In the microphone. I would like for the folks that were on the Youth Crime Commission to raise their hands because we did have some good meetings and, and, and uh, touch base on a lot of issues. And a lot of our folks are on the ground level with and dealing with the youth on a face to face basis. So we got to raise the Youth Commission. Uh, one of the things that we came up with uh, to piggyback on what Commissioner Love said is that. Really, there are agencies out there to provide services, but it is so fragmented. It's so fragmented and territorial that a lot of times what needs to be done doesn't get done. And we need to come together as a whole to address these issues with our youth. And what we focused on primarily was prevention uh, and targeting youth at a younger age. One of the things that we came up with is getting more involved with the school system, getting the schools involved with the parole involvement. And one of the things that uh, not only Black mentioned that we see as well is that the school is the headquarters for the kids. This way everybody goes during the daytime. They partner up and click up, and then they <coughs> fragment from there, or they break off from there. One of the things we found is a lack of uh, uh, support services for the teachers and the schools in terms of behavioral issues. When those kids 15 and 16 years of, of age get suspended, what are they going to do during the day? A lot of times, it's, it's going to be a break-in or a theft. And then we also got to address the issue of why kids are committing crimes. A lot of our kids are doing it because of survival system. You know, they don't have the means and uh, kids go to school. They don't have the clothes to wear to school for the uniforms. Or if they do have the uniforms, the family household doesn't have the means to keep the clothes clean. And one issue that we've come across is kids going to school with uniforms weren't able to get the clothes clean because the mama didn't have washing powder. So the kid wore the only pair of, of clean pants and shirt, jacket that they had, but they got suspended. Now the kid went to school with good intentions, but got suspended because he didn't have his uniform on. What that kid ended up doing later on that day is breaking into a house. So we created a problem. And we've got to stop creating problems when there are problems. So we've got to look at that. Uh, we've got to address teenage pregnancy. You've got a lot of girls that are getting pregnant, and some of these teenage boys are trying to be responsible. And they're going out committing crimes, stealing cars, breaking in stores, to help support a child. And I don't condone what they do, but sometimes I understand why. But we've got to address that. That's, a, that's another issue. Uh, getting the parole involvement, uh, <coughs> targeting kids that are not committing crimes. We've got to address those, and Ms. Kelly came up with a plan of maybe working with those boys, that teenage boys that are not uh, with a criminal history, to get them involved with maybe a security firm or some sort of career to steer them away from going down the road of committing illegal acts. 
getting more involved with the community outreach program. We've been involved with the community outreach program with MPD, and it's been successful. It breaks down those barriers to where kids start to respect law enforcement. They have more respect for themselves and adults. A lot of what we came up with is grassroots effort, preventive measures, but it doesn't cost a whole lot of money. Now, we would like to be one of those nonprofit agencies that get some of that money to show that we can put some <coughs> things out there on the table. We feel like we can do it. But we've got to start working together and start targeting the real issues. And we just can't keep our head in the sand about it. You know, these are issues that are going to fester, they're going to grow, and we're going to be dealing with it for years to come. Just like you mentioned, a 17 or 18, 19 year old kid without an education, what is he going to do? He can't get a job. It takes a, it takes a high school diploma to work at McDonald's now. And, and on top of that, you've got adults working teenager jobs trying to survive. So these kids are not going to get gainful employment. And we've got to address these issues when they're 11, 12, or 13 years of age. We've got to get juvenile court more involved to identify the kids that when they do commit or present to juvenile court, we can work with those youth at a younger age and break that cycle of going in and out of juvenile court. Because once you develop a record, it sticks with you. It's going to be with you until adulthood unless you know how to get it exposed. This a lot of our kids don't know how to exposed. Let, let me just interject uh, uh, before you close. I want, I want to touch on uh, mental health. And before you respond to that, I, I, want to pose, I want to pose this question to the audience and, and to the media. If, if we have, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a former Marine, and, and I've been trained as, as a Marine to do Marine things, right? But if you send a, 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 a trained Marine to a war zone for a year, and that trained Marine comes back with PTSD, what do you think happens to that four-year-old that lives in a community where you're seeing killing, uh, you know, uh, Possibly domestic violence, you know, uh, uh, other forms of violence, drug dealers, instability, homelessness. Homelessness doesn't mean you're necessarily out on the street. It means you might live with your aunt or your grandmother also, and and and, and right, and, and you 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 know, getting back and forth to school becomes an issue. Switching schools every three or four months. What do you think? What do you think that child is is suffering with by the time he is 16, 17, 18 years old? And you wonder why it's easy for a child, watch this, easy for a child to video with his phone a beating like a beating that took place at Kroger and laugh about it. Because he's become desensitized to death, to violence. So and, and when, and as it relates to crime, now I'm going to ask y'all, y'all ask yourselves and ask wherever your circle is. And we got a couple of mental health professionals in here besides Mr. Scott and Dr. Teresa, Teresa Hall. Um, ask yourselves, are we dealing with a, a health issue as it relates to crime? I mean, think about it. Think about that. Now, here, here, here's the thing, and I've been really, really thinking about this the last couple, this has been heavy on my heart the last couple of days. You know, most of the kids still are still eligible for 10 kids. But we're not getting them the therapy or the help that they need at an early enough age to where they can keep the balance of that of being a kid, number one. You see what I'm saying? They should still be watching you know, Nickelodeon and not watching World Star Hip Hop. But, 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 that, but that has changed. And so, and, and so there's, a, there's an opportunity, and maybe we need to see what happens with this. And, and you know, y'all know I'll shoot straight, man. There's, there's a difference, there's a cultural difference between the black community and the white community. Mm -hmm. The white community don't have an issue with going to see their therapist. Right. There's a stigma attached to yeah. black folks saying, I'm going to see a therapist or a psychiatrist. Or he's crazy, he's getting a crazy chick. You see what I'm saying? But, but we have to remove that stigma because we're losing our kids to mental health issues. And I, now, I, again, I just want to leave you with the comparison. The trained Marine that goes to war comes back home with PTSD for one year of war, or that four-year-old whose mind is not even completely developed yet, seeing violence and, and, and all the other things that, that are happening in this 
uh, basically a war zone also, for 10 to 12 years with no help. I don't believe that was so. Well, Mrs. Scott? I was getting to that point. Oh, thank you. I wish everybody would stop there in my, still in my thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and to, get to, to get to your point, the difference between a military personnel that goes overseas and, and in a war zone and a child that's living in a, a traumatic situation is that personnel, that military personnel can leave. The child stays there. And it grows up in that environment. So it never leaves. It's just a day-to-day -day operation, just a day-to-day -day process. And those children become desensitized. So, and studies have shown that once you're in that environment, you're going to emulate or participate in what you see on a day-to-day -day basis. Military personnel, nine times out of 10, can leave. Our young people are staying in that same environment from day to day to day until they can grow up and leave out of that environment, if they can. I guess he left. Uh, look, and, but, and, and then to the point of receiving services, yeah, it is a cultural stigma for our, for our children and our families to receive services. And that's one of the things that we need to get more proactive with and address these issues with kids at a, at a younger age to help them grow and be productive and live a, uh, a normal and, and quote unquote healthy life. Representative Douglas Pastors Consortium, uh, with the pastors, we come together and we think of uh, solutions that uh, we in the Christian community, the faith based community, is able to interact with all the different uh, programs that we have going on. What we have discovered is that a lot of times uh, we get so complacent uh, in the faith base within the four walls of the church to where we do not address the real issues. Uh, and we understand that we have people that is, uh, come to church and uh, youth and adults that is actually have a lot of real issues, such as issues as what he has spoke about uh, and things like that. And what we are doing, we are encouraging and trying to support our uh, uh, members and our guests uh, that one thing they have to get more involved uh, uh, in the community uh, and stop uh, uh, sitting back and allowing things to happen. And you go on uh, from day to day and just saying that this is just the way it is, that this is the way it should be. Uh, we're encouraging, uh, do not put up with uh, uh, blighted properties. Do not put up, you see things going on, you need to get involved. You see things that's not right, you need to get involved. And we in the church not only uh, are we offering that, but then we are offering uh, uh, ways for them to actually get help. Get help. And, uh, and that's, that's where we are at. We are, we're just trying to come together with all different uh, types of denominations. And we just all were one accord, and one accord is for us to be able to uh, come together to get the issues at hand resolved. Because it always affects everyone, not just one person, but everyone. Well, that's a good one, Pastor. Uh, I, remember, I mentioned earlier about the clergy watch, it's something we've started about the last couple of weeks. Uh, Major Sharon, my second in command, as well as one of my neighborhood watch coordinators, have been going around to the local churches. Uh, it with the ministers and we're hoping to start a clergy watch where the ministers of that church will come to the precinct once a quarter, once every three months, uh, and let us know what it is that you're concerned, what your concerns are about. The first meeting is on April 7th. Yeah, Tuesday, April 7th. If you would let other ministers that you know in the Fraser neighborhood, Fraser Raleigh area, uh, let them know that we're still going out to touch bases face to face with them as well. And when our first meeting is going to be April 7th. Uh, at 5.30 at the precinct, at Old Island Precinct, at 3633 Old Island Road, and hopefully we can help, you know, you all and, and your and your, and your parishioners to discuss and to talk about what is going on in their neighborhoods. Again, once we get started, we will have people to come in and talk to you, hopefully uh, finding some solutions and some answers to the questions that you just brought up. But again, it's April the 7th at 5.30 here at Old Island Precinct. Like I said, this is we just started a couple of weeks ago. 
uh, going from church to church, trying to get uh, ministers to, to come to this meeting, and hopefully we'll see you there as well. Let me just piggyback on, uh, because I, I, I know that for the most part, it talks about youth crime and being engaged. One of the most effective things that I've found effective is mentoring. Uh, I see Melinda Campbell here, there are various mentoring organizations that's in our community. If we're going to make an impact, then we have to be willing to volunteer and go up some of our time. What did I mean by that? I mean, donate one hour a week, four hours a month, to make an impact with our young people. When you look at the demographics in the Shelby County Schools, over 70% of our youth are from single parent homes. 70% are from single parent homes. There's a greater need for African American men to step up and become mentors and work with our young men. I get the calls of needing someone to spend time with their sons from mothers. And when we put it out there, we are the last ones, African American men, to step up to the plate. You have the white females, the white males, the black females, but the African American men, those of us who are adults, we are the last one to step up to the plate. We have a responsibility to make a difference in our community because these young men are looking up to us. And if we don't make that commitment, then what, I mean, the end result is what we're talking about today, crime. We have to set the example and let them know, first of all, that we love them. Because that's why they join the games. They want attention. They want some love. And they go to these games. But we ought to be able to offer a different example of what they're seeing. And so it's up to us. If we're going to make a change in our communities, then we have to step up to the plate. And I thank each and every one of you who came out tonight because I think you want to make a difference in this community. But we must reach out to those who are not here, such as our neighbors, to help us make this change. And uh, with that, that's right. Exciting for me, because I got the longest list. Yeah. 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 Um, I was representing the communities and neighborhoods, and I appreciate the other 14 members that we call people, we ask neighbors, we ask other neighborhood associations, what all do they hear out in the traffic? And what we have come in is a list that I will read to you because this is what citizens I hear all the time, not just from us, but from other neighborhood associations. Installing cameras in school classrooms and stairways. Enforcing the law requiring the sidewalks to be repaired to make them more user friendly. Getting current lists, such as neighborhood associations, community councils, businesses, apartments, to have current contact info and update every three months. Installing speed humps seems to slow down crime. Check and keep an eye on vacant property near you. If you see a rental or a for sale sign, get the information from the sign and keep it somewhere in case you need it for the police, code, or to complain to the owner. When police are dispatched to a house, apartment, business, etc., if they could also be the eyes for the code violators, violations, excuse me, and report the violation. As we know, flight and crime go hand in hand. The code inspectors hold the key to improving our city. We need foot patrol in areas where property values are $40,000 or less. These are areas most likely that are not going to have associations or neighborhood watches. Most of these houses are old with structural issues, rot, roof repairing, replacing rotten and broken windows, peeling paint, hanging gutters, broken concrete, junk, overgrowth of grass and hedges, underbrush, <coughs> dead trees and bushes, poor street lighting, street and sidewalk paving. The people who live in these areas are probably the original aging owner 
These people are probably afraid to report their neighbor, have no knowledge of 311, or afraid to report their landlord because they might raise their rent or evict them. Property values would not rise if code violations are not corrected and maintained. We need to inform the qualified seniors that help and resources are available to them to repair their homes. Aesthetics give pride to a neighborhood. With crime, people will not invest in businesses. Properties will not be sold, and landlords are afraid their properties will be vandalized when vacant. Be a good neighbor and watch out for vacant properties next to you. People should have knowledge of the tools and knowledge of using Tom Leatherwood's site. There you can see what a property, <coughs> it gives you the history of the property and who owns it. Also, Memphis Daily News is a good um, source to look up a particular um, owner. <coughs> you can type in who owns who, by, you can type in a name or you can type it in by address and it gives you the public current records, especially if it's a tenant living there. You can type in that address and look at the history of that person living in that house. Social media is very important, along with using your apps. Facebook, Twitter, and Nextdoor are also available to connect with your neighbors. That way you can use it as a blog. Be familiar with the Memphis Police site. They have tools that are available to you to use to log in. They have CyberWatch, CityWatch, Steincroppers, Who's in Jail, Warrant Searches, Sex Offenders. All this is available to you to check out who lives next to you or in your neighborhood. Familiarize yourself with the Shelby County Sheriff's Office um, website. They also have a Facebook account. A t there's a, um, coming up April the 15th through the 17th, there is a City of Memphis <coughs> Neighborhood Redevelopment Conference that people are welcome to attend. Landlords should be held accountable for their properties and to whom they rent to. They should use the Memphis Daily News and you can see who you're renting to. Personally, I do use it. I am a landlord, and I do check that Memphis Daily News to look at the history of somebody. And I keep tabs on it. Periodically, I look to see if my current tenants are having any issues, because I wouldn't know otherwise. It would give them a look into the person's Shelby County history, and then periodically check on your renters to look for their current activities. The landlord may find out they might be a warrant out for his renter, and the owner should notify the police. Police should be able to notify owners whenever they're dispatched to your rental property. Many times, the owner is the last one to know. Have the landlord of the rental property and the realtors, when they sell a home, to attach a revised flyer of our city codes and ordinances and have the tenants and the owners initialize and let it become part of your lease and contract. Some of the ordinances in this city are not enforceable. In the codes and ordinances that we do have, the penalties are a slap on the wrist. Enforce and give stricter penalties for existing laws and pass new ones. This includes the judges, for they need to pass stricter penalties. I am sick of repeat offenders. Many break the law on the weekends and after hours when they know that the code inspectors are not around. We need code to work hours after hours and Saturdays and Sundays and rotating shifts like MPD. They should be able to issue them a ticket on the spot instead of giving them extra time of days to go back to recheck the waste of gas and money. Owner should disclose if a house was previously a meth house or if it was a murder scene. Owners of rental properties should be required to have a license. Many states do require that. Google in to find out what other cities have in their requirements. Tennessee is very lax as far as how rental properties are handled. 
Theodore, let me, let me jump in real quick. So if you own a rental property, you don't have to disclose if someone was killed in? And, and real quick also, um, any, any of our Memphis police officers, anybody want to speak to the time it takes for uh, code enforcement issues to be processed? Anyone? Y'all want to speak to code? I'm waiting here for some of Well, Councilman Boyd, uh, uh, Berlin. Seven days. You're not going to get away days. Yeah. Uh, back on the code issue. You, you touched on the code issue. Um, about code enforcement not being a government. I have several we that have been waiting years meetings. to get something done. <laughs> Theodore, and, and also, if, if you can, when we, when we move forward, let's condense it a little because we got seven pages, which you got to get in. You know, so we, and we, we got to get have time to make sure that we get to the questions and answers for them also. Okay. Want to touch on that? Yeah. It takes uh, approximately seven days for uh, code enforcement issues to be handled. Uh, code enforcement is backlogged a little bit. Um, and we're trying to streamline the process. As a matter of fact, I'm working on uh, some policies now to help uh, code enforcement expedite the way uh, uh, cases are handled. Okay, thank you, Theodore. I know every point that you have on there is important. I know it is. I know it is. So, but, but if you can touch on the most important kind of priority. GPS guns. Okay, yeah. Touch <laughs> on. <laughs> right. And touch on the most important one. Which and, I do and, and, and that. And some of the, if you know, also some of the uh, points that you that you're making also will be asked in some of these questions. So we want you to answer through some of your points also. And um, she did have the longest list, which is good because that's the involvement that we want. You know, people to be really engaged in this process. So, you know, yeah. um, placing cameras in troubled areas was another one. And some of them touched about the neighborhood watch and the clergy watch. Uh, that was also included with the citizens, which I'm glad that I heard that also. Explain, expanding the blue crush uh, and the body and police having body cameras was another one that people were interested in having. And promote kids who are leaders in our schools. There are kids who.